Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we are exploring our virtual learning experiences for 2022 winter. My name is John Shoemaker, and I am a technology program specialist in the Department of Educational Technology. And I am here today hosting, uh, not Loggerhead, we are at Manatee Lagoon. I apologize, everyone. We're at Manatee Lagoon. That was Loggerhead was this morning. So let me uh, get that presentation up. So we are at Manatee Lagoon over uh, out over by on the island. So we're so excited. We think there may be some manatees out there because we know here in Florida, for those of you who are here with us in Florida, it has cooled off a little bit. Um, but before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping as we always do. Don't forget this session is being recorded. It is live on YouTube and it will be on our channel and all of our Virtual learning experiences live on our channel from May of 2020 all the way up until now. Um, so please feel free to join us uh, on our channel and watch all of our other sessions. And please feel free to share this with your peers as well and let them uh, watch this tomorrow or any other day of the week. We also would love to see what you're doing in your classroom. So please share with us out on Twitter at EdTechPBC. And you can also use the hashtag ETPBCPD. Don't forget down below to like and subscribe to our channel. Like this video, we've got, uh, we're up to 5.4 almost thousand people subscribed to the channel. And we've got a lot of people watching our virtual learning experiences. Hopefully we have some of our friends from Georgia like we had this morning here too. So don't forget you can use that chat box over there to talk to us. We want you to uh, click in there if it's your first time, create a channel and then if you're a teacher, to share your students' questions with us as we are going through Manatee Lagoon. We want to have questions so that we can ask our friends there and get the question, the answers from the experts. And uh, we also have some moderators in the chat. They will have a wrench next to their name. And so with that, um, I am actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Dana Rubenstein, who is at Manatee Lagoon, and she is going to take it from here. So Dana, take it away. Hi everyone, hello from Manatee Lagoon. I am so excited to join you from this amazing facility. And we are joined by Christina and Rachel and we have someone moderating the chat and you are in for a treat because when I arrived, I have a secret. There was a manatee. So hopefully the manatee is still there. We're gonna try really hard to find it again, but we are gonna turn it on over to Christina. So give me a second to change the camera setting and she is going to teach us all about manatees. Okay, hello everyone. Again, my name is Christina and I am a manatee master here at Manatee Lagoon. So I am going to be telling you all all about manatees and their friends in the Lake Worth Lagoon. And as was mentioned before, if you have any questions, please send them in the chat because I really should be able to answer any question you have about marine biology or manatees as we go through this day. So to get started, right behind me, as you can see, I have two very big skeletons. So these are manatee skeletons. I've had a lot of people ask me if they are dinosaurs. They do look rather big, but that's because our manatees are actually very, very big animals. And a lot of times, if you haven't seen them in person, you don't understand just how big they are. So this skeleton right here is from a manatee who is actually named Sketchy. So when a manatee has been seen by scientists many times, they're actually able to give that manatee a name. So Sketchy is here with us at Manatee Lagoon because unfortunately she was hurt in a boat strike incident. Um, so because of that, she passed away, but she's able to help us learn a lot about manatees. So she was an adult um, when we got her skeleton. So Sketchy actually did have several babies throughout her life, several calves that scientists were able to see. And we have a skeleton behind Sketchy that is not one of her babies, but is a young manatee skeleton. So you can see right behind, we have this smaller skeleton here. So our adult manatees on average are about 10 feet long. For scale, I'm about five feet tall. So two of me on top of each other, um, is about an average adult manatee. I'm not very tall, I feel like, so I, am, I would be a very small manatee. And then this small skeleton here is um, of a manatee calf or a young manatee. 
And when manatees are born, they are about three to four feet long, so they are quite big babies. And that's because our mother manatees will be pregnant between 12 and 13 months, so a little over a year long, and they give birth to those very big babies. So I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about the bones that you see here on this skeleton and go into a little bit of detail on them. So the first thing that a lot of people notice when they come to Manatee Lagoon is that these manatee skeletons look like they have hands on them. So if you look right over here, you can actually see that it looks like our manatee has five fingers, just like we do. Uh, and this is because manatees are mammals, just like us. They're marine mammals. And so there's going to be a lot of similarities between our skeletons and a manatee skeleton. So even though manatees do have those five fingers that you see here, when they're actually in the water, you can't see each of those fingers. They have them all covered up by a flipper. And those flippers help them to swim in the water and also help them when they're eating seagrass. So they use those flippers for a lot of different purposes. Um, but they have those unique flippers because they're much better at swimming in the water. If you think about it, if you've ever gone swimming, it's much easier to swim when your hands are like this in cups than it is to swim with your fingers wide open. So the manatees have flippers like we see in lots of other marine mammals, and that helps them to swim in the water better. So we have a lot of other cool bones on this manatee. Right here you can see these very big bones. These are the rib bones. Manatees are very interesting with their rib bones. They don't have one set amount like a lot of other animals. They can have between 16 and 18 pairs of ribs, depending on the manatee. But these rib bones are very big, and they're going to protect all of the really important organs inside of the manatee. So right under the spine here is where our manatees have their lungs. They have them up close to their back because they want to keep their lungs safe, right? Breathing is very important, and our manatees have to hold their breath when they are swimming in the water. So they have really big, long lungs that are in the back. And then inside of them, they have lots and lots of intestines because manatees only eat seagrass. And when you only eat seagrass, you have to digest it a lot because it doesn't have as much energy as the foods that maybe we eat. So they have to spend a lot of time digesting their food and they have really, really long intestines to do that. And so that's what fills up a lot of their body. A lot of people, when they think of manatees, they think of a really chunky animal. And they say those are, they call them um, chubby unicorns, or chubby mermaids is what I've heard people call manatees before. A little bit, but manatees actually don't have a lot of body fat. They only have about a quarter inch of body fat throughout their whole body, which means it can be a little bit difficult to stay warm. So when we get cold, we can put on a jacket, we can go inside where there is nice heat. Manatees obviously can't do either of those things, and they do not have blubber like a lot of other marine mammals. So what do they do? Well, manatees swim to warm water. So before people were around, manatees had lots of different springs um, that were nice and warm naturally, but as humans developed areas, those springs became less available. So manatees, they're very smart, and they started to realize there were these nice warm water areas that they could safely go to. And believe it or not, those were power plant outflows. So Manatee Lagoon is actually built on a power plant outflow. And um, the manatees like to come here in the winter time and stay safe in the warm water. So instead of having blubber, um, they swim to warm places, and that is why the manatees visit us at Manatee Lagoon in the first place. In fact, manatees really cannot handle cold temperatures, and the coldest temperature they can tolerate in the water is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Anything colder than 68 degrees Fahrenheit is too cold for the manatees. So sometimes when it gets too cold, they have to choose if they want to stay warm or eat their grass. So that's why it's really important for manatees to have safe, warm places that they can go to, to keep safe. And then when it warms up during the day, they can go out and look for their grass. 
Manatees actually spend about eight hours a day looking for and eating seagrass. So that's about as long as you spend in school every day. Manatees are out looking for their food, which is a lot of work. And then for about 12 hours during the day, manatees like to just kind of relax. They are very, very chill animals. So they will spend a lot of time just relaxing. They live in really shallow water. So they will either sit on the bottom or just float in the water. Um, a lot of people think that manatees can hold their breath for a really, really long time. And it depends. So if a manatee is taking a nap, if they're relaxing, they can hold their breath up to 20 minutes, which to me is a really long time because I don't think I can even hold my breath for a minute. But compared to some other animals that live in the ocean, it's not as long, but it's pretty long for a mammal. But when they're swimming and when they're moving actively and using up all of their oxygen, manatees can hold their breath for about two to three minutes. So they like to take breaths more frequently if they're doing something that takes a lot of energy, like swimming. Um, manatees, when they're swimming, usually swim at about three to five miles per hour. But if they need to get somewhere in a rush, they can swim at burst speeds of up to 20 miles per hour, which is very fast. I could not even probably swim three to five miles per hour. So 20 miles per hour is very impressive. Like I said, a lot of people judge these manatees by their appearance, but they're actually very, very athletic animals. So I'm going to show you all up close some manatee bones that we have here that are not in the skeleton. So, like I said, the first bone that I mentioned was a rib bone. So manatees have, like I said, really big ribs, and this one's a little smaller than the one we saw on the skeleton. But as you can see on me right here, it would be a little bit too big for me. So manatee ribs are really heavy. In fact, all of their bones are really heavy because manatees like to sink down in the water so that they can stay right where their food is. The reason their bones are so heavy is actually because their bones are completely dense. So I'm going to show you a cross section of a manatee rib bone. So this is a cross section of a manatee rib bone. So it's like if we took a rib like this and we cut it in half. And as you can see here, that rib bone is completely dense. Now this is very different from our bones. So our bones are a little bit spongier inside. We have bone marrow inside of our bones that um, helps to make a lot of our blood cells and helps to keep us healthy. Now manatees do have bone marrow, but they keep it in very specific areas. They keep it in their backbone and in their sternum, but otherwise their bones are totally solid. Now, these really solid bones are super helpful for if you want to be very heavy and sink to the bottom. Because like I said, manatees eat seagrass, so they want to sink to the bottom where their seagrass is. It's much easier, if you've ever gone swimming, um, I always say if you've ever gone swimming and you've used pool toys, right, and someone might throw them to the bottom. Well, if you want to get that pool toy at the bottom, you spend a lot of energy and push very hard to get down to those toys. Manatees kind of do the opposite. They're so heavy that they sink to the bottom and they only have to spend energy when they want to breathe air. So they can come back up to breathe air and then go back to the bottom where their food is. And that is a lot easier when all of your food is at the bottom. It saves you a lot of energy. Now, while that is an advantage to having really dense bones, there are some disadvantages. So. Right here, I have another manatee rib bone. But as you can see, this one looks a little bit different, right? It has this really big bump here. It looks like it has a hole in it. So I'd like to give you all a minute, if anyone wants to make an educated guess, why there might be a difference between this bone, and again, I'll show you, this other rib bone. So there's a really big difference. So if anyone wants to send them in the chat, we can take some guesses. It does take a second for everyone to hear you and answer. So while they are while they are saying that, we do have a question from a, a classroom, if you don't mind answering while we're here. Um, so they have a couple questions from Blue Lake Elementary. So when do manatees sleep or do they sleep? That's 
That is a really good question. So similar to a lot of marine mammals, um, manatees have to be very picky about when they sleep, right? They can only hold their breath for up to 20 minutes. So a lot of information about how animals sleep in the ocean is unknown because the way that we can figure out if, a, if an animal is sleeping is actually by taking scans of their brain. And it wasn't until very recently that scientists were able to take scans of a dolphin brain and figure out how they sleep. So unless I have Miss Rachel and Miss Chelsea here, unless they know something different about manatees sleeping, it still might not be studied because we need to take an MRI of a manatee brain to know exactly how they sleep. But that could be something that our future scientists could figure out because we definitely want to learn how our manatees sleep. But if it's similar to a dolphin or a lot of other animals that live in the ocean, basically what they do is they take turns which half of their brain is taking a rest so that they can still focus on how to breathe and how to stay safe in the water. So usually they have half of their brain sleep at a time, but that is for dolphins and other marine mammals. It might not be exactly the same for manatees, and it might take a lot more research to be able to figure out exactly how manatees sleep. It'd be very hard to get a manatee in an MRI machine, but I'm sure it will be done eventually. Yeah, maybe one of our students in that third grade class at Blue Lake will be the person who figures that out. So. I agree. Um, so we do have a, any, a possible answer to your question, uh, possibly age as to why those bones are so different. That is a very good guess. That is not exactly it, but that is part of it, definitely. Our older manatees are more likely to have these um, problems with the bones. So I'm going to tell everyone what it is with this bone. So this right here is a bone of a manatee that was in a boat strike incident. So like I mentioned before, a lot of our manatees can unfortunately be hit by boats when they're in the water. There's a lot of reasons for this. A lot of them are that manatees live in very shallow water. So if a boat is going through the water, it's very easy to hit that manatee. A lot of it is that manatees have a really hard time telling where a sound is coming from. So they don't necessarily know how to avoid something if they hear a loud sound. And also manatees don't have any natural predators, so they don't know that they should be scared of things that are very big and approaching them. So um, this is from a manatee that was hurt um, by a boat. And what happened here is after this manatee was hurt, if um, a human was hurt, we might go to the doctor, we might get a cast, we might go to school and have everyone sign our cast. If a manatee is hurt by a boat, they cannot go to a doctor right away and get help Instead, they just have to keep doing everything that manatees have to do. So they have to keep swimming, they have to keep eating, they have to keep breathing. And what happens is their bones don't heal back perfectly smooth. So they heal back kind of bumpy. And they can also get infections. So this hole in this bone is probably from an infection from bacteria eating that bone. So it can be very painful for our manatees, which is why it's so important that when we're using boats, we wear polarized sunglasses. I have mine right here. They help us to look for the manatees in the water. And it's also important that we teach people all about boating rules so that they know not to hit our manatees in the water. Because even though they're very big and very tough animals, they can also get really badly hurt if they are hurt, uh, hit by a boat. Um, so this was, again, this is our bone, our rib bone of a manatee that was hurt. Um, another really big problem with the manatee getting hit is that it can hurt their lungs. So like I said, manatees keep their lungs on their back. So they're up top and that's where they often get hit. And these bones can puncture their lungs and lungs are kind of like balloons. We inflate them and then we deflate them. And if that balloon has a hole in it, it cannot inflate and deflate the way it should. So it can cause problems for balance. It sometimes causes our manatees to go a little bit sideways, or it can cause them to not be able to go to the bottom where their food is, and they can get very, very hungry. So we like to avoid any of our manatees being in that situation. Um, but I'm done with these bones, and I have my favorite bone to show you all. So this is probably the coolest bone. So this is a manatee lower jaw bone. So on a person, this lower bone right here. So manatees have super fancy teeth. Um, 
we don't even have teeth as fancy as the manatees. I'm kind of jealous of them. So manatees do not ever have to worry about brushing their teeth, about flossing their teeth, about going to the dentist because they have these fancy teeth. So as humans, when we're born, we don't have any teeth in our mouth. Then we get our baby teeth. Our baby teeth fall out. We get our big teeth. That's it, right? If we lose our big teeth, we do not get new ones. Manatees have a different situation. So because they're eating grass so much, their teeth are adapted to help them eat grass all day long. So basically, their teeth are flat molars. So they're molars, just like the molars we have that help us chew and grind. They only have molars for chewing and grinding because they only eat grass. So what happens is that these molars that are at the front, they get worn down because they're being used the most. And as they get worn down, eventually they will fall out. So these ones are still in here, obviously but some up here look like they fell out, we're missing teeth. And then what happens is these brand new teeth in the back actually grow in and they push forward and then they have a brand new tooth in the back and the same cycle starts over. So we like to call this the marching molars. So those vanity molars are marching their way down the mouth, down the jaw, and that way our manatees don't ever really have to worry about losing their teeth or about going to the dentist. So they're very lucky in that way. Um, but you can kind of tell the teeth in the front are a little bit more worn down. And when people see these in person, they often say, those teeth look dirty. They are kind of dirty. They're eating grass um, all day long, grass and sandy things. So they do get worn down. Um, but it's also important to note when these would be in the mouth, there's also gums in the mouth that are keeping these teeth in place. So they don't just look like this, look all shaky. They are, they are held in place. Um, but the manatees lose their teeth every two to three months or so, um, and then they get replaced. So they are very lucky in that way. Now, before I ask for questions, I'm going to give you all a couple of little hints, okay? So these teeth are very cool, right? Like I said, but we're mammals and manatees are mammals, but they have really special teeth. There's only a few other mammals that have special teeth, just like the manatees do. And one of them is actually very closely related to the manatee, but it lives on land. So I would like to give everyone a second to guess, but I'm gonna give you a couple of hints. So the manatee does have a relative that lives on land. It has teeth just like this manatee does, and it is also big and gray, but it does live on land. So I'd like to see if any of my classes want to give me a guess as to who a, a grass-eating big animal on land might be who is my manatee cousin. Okay, we're waiting for some responses to come in here. I think I know, but I'm not going to say it. Um, thank you. We don't want to ruin the surprise. Right. right? No. Any but of our classes out there have any ideas on what land animal it's related to or similar to? Yeah, they are related. They're like cousins. They're very, okay. very distant cousins, about 60 million years, but they are cousins. Got it. Okay, so we have an Element, elephant or a capybara? Elephant is right. We got it on the first guess. So. Wow. And then Tasha also said hippo or elephant. So, all right. Good guesses. Those were some excellent guesses. So, yes, manatees are related to elephants. They're like cousins. And they have a couple of similarities. So, like I mentioned, they have the same teeth. They both like to eat grasses. They're both called herbivores. They both eat grasses. And they also have a couple of funny things. So elephants are very famous for their trunks, right? They can use their trunks to grab things. Their trunks are called a prehensile limb. So what that means is that they can use that trunk to grab, but it's not a hand. Well, manatees also have a prehensile limb. It is their mouth. So their lips are really good at grasping. So a lot of times what manatees will do is use their flippers to grab seagrass and then use their lips. I'm not as graceful as a manatee, so I, I'm not showing it very well, but they will use their lips to grab at that seagrass and pull it into their mouth and eat it. 
the final similarity between elephants and manatees is my favorite. We know how when we draw an elephant, we always have to include toenails, right? You always have to draw the toenails on the feet of the elephant. Well, manatees also have toenails. They actually have fingernails on their front flippers, and they have little fingernails that look just like the finger and toenails on an elephant. Um, but it's very cool to see the similarities between these two, and they are actually related, but some of them are on land, obviously, and some of them live in the water. So now that we've gotten through this section, I want to give a chance for my classes to ask questions on anything we've done so far before we learn about some other things about manatees. One of the parts of the question from before was um, from, the, from the same school, Blue Lake, are manatees smart? That is a really good question. So it's really hard to figure out if animals are smart or not, but there are a couple of things that manatees do that tell us that they might be pretty intelligent. So manatees have really, really good memories. So it's really hard to rate animals to say how smart they are compared to us. But manatees are very good at remembering. Um, and manatees are also very curious. So they like to explore their habitat. There was a very funny video the other day of a manatee trying to get on a surfboard. And you might not see a lot of animals doing that. Um, but they're very curious and they remember important places. So they remember where there's warm water, uh, like at Manatee Lagoon. We have lots of manatees that come here year after year and visit us. So I don't know if a manatee would, let's say, be good at doing math or taking a test. But they do, they are smart in their own ways. So they're very good at remembering and they're very curious. Awesome. I think that's all the questions we have for now. But if we get some more coming in, I'll hold them for later for sure. All right. So we are going to walk to our Perfect. next area. So we're going to follow Christina as yes. we take a little stroll through Manatee Lagoon. So the next thing we're going to look at is some materials about manatee conservation as well as some of the friends of the manatee that we see at the Lake Worth Lagoon. So we are heading to our lagoon tank first and see our manatee satellite map. So one of the things that I was mentioning earlier was that if a manatee gets sick or hurt, they can't necessarily go to the doctor right away. And that's true, a manatee can't, they don't have lungs, they can't talk to anyone or ask and call, but a lot of times there are scientists that are looking around to see if there's any sick manatees. A lot of scientists also rely on regular people and kids like everyone listening to see if they see a sick manatee and call the right people for help. So, Fish and Wildlife is one of the people that will help a manatee. And if a manatee is rescued, um, they will go to basically a manatee hospital um, and they can get help with things like broken bones or with like having trouble feeding or breathing. So they can get help with that. And if the manatee gets better, some manatees can never go back in the wild. Some manatees need to stay in zoos and aquariums. So for example, at Epcot, at Disney World, there are some manatees there. There was one there the last time I visited named Big Joe, and he could not ever be in the wild again. So he had a really big injury on his tail, and he couldn't quite swim right. So he has to live, he's actually pretty lucky because he gets people to feed him all day long. And so he lives there with people who take care of him. But some manatees can get better, and they can be released back into the wild. But all of the scientists and veterinarians and rehabilitators that take care of these manatees, they don't just want to say goodbye manatee and never see them again. So what they do is they use satellite tags. So this is a real satellite tag that um, could be used on a manatee. And manatees are a little bit of a challenge to put satellite tags on. So they're a little bit difficult because of the way they are. So they don't have a very big neck, right? They have kind of a, a chunky neck, so you can't put anything on there. And then they have soft skin like us, so you can't glue anything to them, like with sea turtles, right? So when you're tracking a sea turtle, you can glue a tracker right onto their shell. So they're a little tricky. So what scientists do is they make a little belt. The manatees have the most fashionable tags. So they have a little belt that goes right above their tail 
in an area that has a very funny name. It's actually called the peduncle. That is one of my favorite science words. The peduncle is where the tail meets the body. So the tag goes right on the peduncle, and then it just follows behind the manatee in the water. So um, the different parts of the tag, like I said, this is the belt. This is the little chain that links it. Um, and then this here is the buoy. So this is what makes the tag float. And this is the receiver. So the reason that uh, manatee tags have buoys, the reason they have to float, is because you can't send messages to a satellite from under salt water. So this has to sit on top of the salt water for the message to be able to be sent to the, scientist, to the satellite and then back to the scientist to know where the manatee is. Um, there are quite a few silly manatees that have been tagged. My absolute favorite is a manatee named Kessie. So Kessie does not have a tag on him right now, but he did for quite a while because he was crazy. So Chessie is named after the Chesapeake Bay. So manatees do migrate in the summertime. They can go north where normally they can't in the winter where it's a little colder. But in the summer it warms up everywhere. So Chessie would go north and he swam to the Chesapeake Bay. Well normally, by the time it starts getting colder, manatees start swimming back down. But Chessie said, I don't think so. I don't think I want to swim anymore. So he stayed in the Chesapeake Bay. So he had to be rescued. So he was flown back down to Florida. And everyone was like, okay, we saved Chessie, thank goodness. And then he did it again. So the next year, Chessie swam back to the Chesapeake Bay. He waited until winter time, and he had to be flown down again. So he loves flying in airplanes. Um, but because of that, uh, because of the tag that he had, scientists were able to see where he was going. Uh, and they were able to help him out um, because Chessie was very, very silly. Um, but manatees, they like to do their own thing. They don't really travel in groups. They're very solitary unless we see maybe a mom and her baby. Manatees are on their own. So a lot of people see this tag and they go, does that hurt the manatee? That's a very good question. And it does not. So like I said, manatees are about 10 feet long. So even though this tag might look big to us, it is not very big at all compared to a manatee. And it's not very heavy either. Like I said, I can hold the whole thing with one hand. It's not very heavy at all. And one of our other manatee masters, he said, I'm going to do some math. I want to figure out just how heavy this is to a manatee. Um, and he said that when he did the math, this is about as heavy as holding a cell phone and some car keys. So the manatees really don't mind it. And it allows us to keep them safe after they've gotten help from scientists. So it keeps our manatees very safe and it lets us track them, which is very fun. We had a manatee stop by Manatee Lagoon just last week. He was actually from Georgia. He was in Savannah and his name is Sammy G. And he visited us and we saw his satellite tag in the water. So we took a picture of it and sent it in and asked like, who is this manatee? And we found out it was Sammy G who had gone all the way up to Savannah and then was coming back down for the winter time. So it's very fun to track them. You can track Sammy G in Clearwater Aquarium if anyone wants to see what Sammy G is up to, but he was here last week. So I'm also going to show you where the tag actually goes on the manatee. So this is one of our, obviously our pretend manatees, it's much too small, um, but I'm going to show you how the tag attaches to it. So this is a manatee, let's say he got hurt from a boat, he has some scars, but he's gotten better. Um, but the scientists still want to track him and keep an eye on him just in case. So, we have our tiny manatee tag right here. So they take the belt, and the belt goes right above the tail right here. And then, the manatee tag tag. And then, this just floats behind the manatee in the water like this. So it just swims along, and if the manatee dies, then the tag might get pulled under, um, but the tags really don't bother the manatees. This is even bigger than a manatee would be to scale. This would be much smaller if this was a full-size manatee. But again, it helps us to keep track of the manatee. So, um, we also have right next to us, this is a very exciting because it's a rather new fish tank at Manatee Lagoon, and we have some pretty cool fish in here. So manatees are very good neighbors, and they hang out around a lot of different fish in the Lake Worth Lagoon. 
So we have a couple of cool ones in here that I'm going to tell you about. So if you come over to the thing. We have one right here. He's my favorite. Um, so this right here uh, is a porcupine fish, also commonly known as a puffer fish. Uh, so these guys can get much bigger and puff up with air if they are scared. Um, just like a lot of us have seen in, in TV or movies, they really do that in real life when they are scared that they might be eaten. Now this fish swimming over here is a sergeant major. So we have lots of sergeant majors that hang out at Manatee Lagoon. They are little reef fish. They like to swim around reefs. Um, and again, they are just a, a little fish that doesn't mind spending a lot of time around the manatees. And then the third fish that we have in there is our, our porcupine fish again. I think he likes the attention. And then the third fish that we have in here are juveniles or called squirrel fish. Um, and so looking for the squirrel fish, they might be on this side over here. So the thing about the fish in this tank, they're doing a very good job at hiding because this tank looks a lot like the natural habitats that they might live in. So these roots right here look just like mangrove roots. So mangroves are very important trees in South Florida that protect our coasts and they protect our shorelines. And they also clean the water. They're very important and they're very important habitats for lots of little fish like these guys that you see right here. Um, in this tank, we also have one of my favorite animals at Manatee Lagoon is a horseshoe crab. It's the tiniest horseshoe crab I've ever seen before, and I love him, but he's hiding in the sand right now, so you'll have to come visit Manatee Lagoon if you want to see our horseshoe crab, my prized horseshoe crab. Um, but again, all of these fish can be found in Lake Worth Lagoon, so it's definitely cool to see them living in here. Like I said, the porcupine fish, he's kind of a star. <laughs> he likes to, to show off. Um, and we also, it looks like, have a hermit crab in here. There's a hermit crab right there that's walking around, but he might not be all the way out of his shell. Hermit crabs are very cool crabs. They do not grow their own shell. They like to find shells in the water. Um, but yeah, this is our very cool fish tank. Do I have any questions on this fish tank or on anything we've talked about in this section? I have not seen any questions coming through yet. As they do, I will let you know. Okay, good. Um, so we are going to try to look outside and see if we see any manatees. So I will warn you ahead of time. It is a little bit warm, so it can be difficult to see manatees, but we did see some today. So I have my fingers crossed. I'm hopeful that we will see them, um, but we're going to go out and look. So when so when you are looking for manatees, the thing to notice is you'll really only see their little nose. They kind of stick their nose out of the water to breathe. Um, but that's really the only part of the manatee you can see. Sometimes you can see their tail flap behind them as they're swimming away, but you won't just see their whole body out of the water. You really just see their little nostrils. So that's what we are going to look for. So we are going to follow Rachel outside to look. Rachel right. helps gonna... with a lot of manatee rescues. Let's take another journey outside. Yeah, so let's keep going outside. We're going to go right down these steps and take a look outside. outflow at Manatee Lagoon. So this is the area of Manatee Lagoon that actually gets heated. So the way this water gets heated is that as you can see, we are right next to a power plant. So this is a combined power plant. So that means that it uses steam energy as the second part of the energy. So the way it works is that water from this lagoon is pulled in. It always stays separate and nice and clean, but that water is pulled in and it cools down machines and makes steam but in the process, the water gets pretty hot. So then 
that hot water comes back out into the lagoon and it keeps this outflow area very warm. It's like a manatee hot tub. They like it a lot. This water is about 10 degrees, 10 to 14 degrees warmer than the rest of the lagoon. So for example, next week when it's supposed to get very, very cold, this water will be nice and warm and we can have up to hundreds of manatees sitting in here all at once. They really like it here um, and it keeps them safe from the cold water because like I said, anything under 68 degrees, manatees can start to get sick and they actually get something called cold stress and that's kind of like hypothermia or frostbite in people. So they can actually get scars on their face around their nose, their little white marks and you can actually see them later on a manatee even if they get back to warm water, they'll keep those scars on them that shows us that they were in the cold water for a really long time. Um, we also see a lot of manatee calves in here because manatee moms think that this water is nice and safe. And it's kind of like if you've ever seen a deer that gets left alone by their mom, sometimes the manatee moms feel like they get slowed down by their babies. So they will leave them somewhere safe and then they'll go look for seagrass and then they'll come pick their their babies up at the end of the day. So it's kind of like manatee daycare. And so we we keep an eye on the babies and make sure that their mom comes and picks them up before we leave uh, or otherwise we call someone to come help the baby. <laughs> so um, we I'm looking to see if we see any manatees and I'm going to put on my polarized sunglasses. Like I said, it makes it easier to see if there's anything in the water. Have we seen any? Or has Fancy Master Shelly seen any? So I'm not seeing any right now, but I will tell you, I do have someone here with me who knows a lot about manatees. And her name is Rachel. And Rachel has actually helped with many rescues and releases of manatees here at Manatee Lagoon and around Manatee Lagoon including a young manatee that had to be rescued from here, if you want to tell them about that manatee. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Christina. So as Christina said, my name is Rachel Shanker, and I'm going to hop in now that Christina has told you so much all about these amazing mammals. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I do. So I'm the conservation liaison and educator here at Manatee Lagoon. So my job is just like Christina to teach everyone, including all of you guys, all about manatees and their ecosystem and their habitat. But in addition to that, I also work directly with Florida Fish and Wildlife to rescue and release manatees. So if there's ever a manatee in trouble here at Manatee Lagoon, we don't interact with the manatees. We're here to observe and educate. But if there is a manatee in trouble, we'll always call Florida Fish and Wildlife. So that number is 888 404 FWCC if you ever see an injured manatee and you want to give them a call. So once they get those calls, or if we see one, we call them, they will come out and they will assess if that manatee needs rescuing or not. And if it does, they'll be the ones to rescue it. And I get to help them with that. So we've rescued quite a few manatees here at Manatee Lagoon over the years. And one that we rescued a few years ago, his name was Toast Stone. So he was a calf, a little baby manatee, and uh, he was rescued because, or he was rescued uh, because of cold stress here and because his mom was missing. So uh, we were able to rescue that manatee, bring it to a rehabilitation center. So there's a few different rehabilitation centers throughout Florida, and there's even some outside of Florida. So one of the main ones that we partner with or Florida Fish and Wildlife partners with is SeaWorld Orlando. So they take in manatees, they rehabilitate them, and then they release them back into the wild. So it was a wonderful full circle story where we were able to release that manatee calf back out into the wild once he grew up enough and once he gained enough weight to safely be returned. So we love those stories that come full circle and have a happy ending. So does anyone have any questions on anything manatee related for me or for Miss Christina? I haven't seen any other questions come in, but I do have one for you guys. My question is, is, um, you know, we like to talk about different careers as well. And your career is obviously an interesting career choice. Um, so how does one get to do what you guys do? If one of our students is interested in becoming working with manatees or doing something like you guys are doing, how did you get to where you are today? What a great question. Christina, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I can start. I can tell your so, story. Um, yes. So the most important thing, and you've 
probably heard this a hundred times, but the most important thing really is to do your absolute best when you are in school. So making sure you're very good at reading, writing, and math, and science, because those really are the foundations for being a scientist. You have to be good at all of those different skills. Um, but besides that, it's really important to volunteer and be active in your community if you can. So um, there is a lot of ways to get involved. A lot of marine biologists start out with land animals. So you can start out with helping animals in animal shelters or with farm animals. There's a, lots of, a lot of different ways, um, but that kind of qualifies you to get to work with the fancy animals, uh, like the ones in the ocean. So when I went to college, I studied biology. Um, and while I was in college, I did an internship with SeaWorld. So I was able to go and work at SeaWorld and teach people all about marine biology. And right now, I'm actually a sea turtle researcher. So like I said, I just worked really, really hard in school and I researched sea turtles. And I also work here teaching people all about manatees. So that's my side, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, so my story is pretty similar. So something we didn't, I don't think we mentioned yet, um, and apologies, we are outside in the wild here, so if that sound gets too loud, throw a, a comment in the chat and we can move back inside to a quieter space. But because we're out here in the wild, there's all sorts of feedback. But uh, a really cool uh, partnership that we have here at Manatee Lagoon is that all of our educators, all of our Manatee Masters, are Florida Atlantic University students. So I myself, I started out here as a Manatee Master, just like Christina, and I've worked here since we first opened almost seven years ago. And so I stayed here, I got uh, my undergraduate degree and then my master's degree. And then I was lucky enough to get a full-time job doing education and animal rescue. Uh, but all of our Manatee Masters are FAU students. We have this really great partnership with the university where uh, FAU students in the field of biology or education, or we've even had some ocean engineering majors come on board and to learn all about manatees and get this wonderful experience doing scientific communication and teaching the public all about marine biology and marine science. And in return here at Manatee Lagoon, we get some really awesome knowledgeable people that uh, work as staff members and teach everyone everything we want them to learn here at the Lagoon. So yeah. That was so informative. Thank you. Can you tell the students about the video that you want to play? Absolutely. So. Although we unfortunately didn't see any manatees right now here at Manatee Lagoon, I do want to point out uh, we do have two cameras that are live streaming all day long. So after this live stream is over, you can go to our website, visit manateelagoon.com. And on the top bar, there is something called a manatee cam. You click that tab and uh, right behind us, I don't know if you can see, but there's a camera up there. And to the side of us here, there's also an underwater camera. So it's really hard to see. It's just that kind of black globe looking camera sticking off of that tall cement uh, block. But that is a live stream that points down at the water so you can see if there are any manatees present. And we also have an underwater camera that just like the name suggests is under the water. So you can see manatees or any of the other really amazing marine life that we see here at Manatee Lagoon. So we are located on the Intracoastal Waterway on the Lake Worth Lagoon. So we have all sorts of really amazing marine life that comes to visit us, including, of course, manatees. We can almost always see barracuda. We even see spotted eagle rays, sometimes sharks and sea turtles. So Christina, did you say you saw something pretty cool on the manatee cam this morning? Yes, we've been seeing a nurse shark swimming back and forth all day. It's actually been here all week. They love it in here because it's nice and warm. Yeah, so we see all sorts of marine life. But uh, we did want to show you a time lapse from last manatee season and let's see if we can show the underwater time lapse from that camera of all the manatees and fish going by.
Awesome. So that was a view of our underwater camera, a time lapse from the entire manatee season. So who remembers when manatee season is? Give you all a moment to answer. When is manatee season? Does anyone know? While we're waiting, I may have to tell uh, Dana and my colleagues, I might have to oh, bail and, and come join you guys. We have a manatee. Uh-oh, oh. we have a manatee. Did you hear that? We have a manatee. So the, okay. the visibility Where? is not great today, but there's a bit of a dark spot. <laughs> yeah. If you, it, it's, there, can you, where am I? Right you're there. pretty much, yeah. Yeah, he's about, he's he's right. kind of that way. So remember, they can hold their breath for a while. So we have to be patient to see when it comes up to breathe. So it's, you, you've got it right in the view. It's just going to be hard to yeah. see. He's a, little, he's a little dark blob. That's what he looks like under the water. But those polarized sunglasses help you spot yes, the manatee. Absolutely. They make it so much easier. Polarized sunglasses are a lot of fun if you're ever at the beach. They help you to see in the water much better. So yeah, he's over there now. So if you want to take a step over. So we'll, we'll wait and see if he comes up to breathe. But it could take up to yeah. 5 to 20 minutes if he uh, hasn't been moving along too much. So, John, I will keep pointing the camera this way. If you wanted, I believe you I'll were saying like something when yes. we interrupted. No worries, I'll keep yours uh, full screen. And I was just saying, I may have to tell my colleagues, since since you guys like people who are in education, I've always wanted to be a marine biologist and I love manatees. So I might have to go hop over to work with you guys at the Manatee Lagoon. Be a perfect fit. Absolutely. <laughs> Come on over, this place is wonderful. For sure. And while they're still looking there, I do have also their website up too. So you can kind of see like what they were talking about with the manatee cam. They've got the underwater camera here and they also have the above water camera here. As everyone's looking, you can kind of see over on that, the, the wall there, uh, everyone's looking at the manatee that's in the water too. So we have multiple views here, thanks to their live camera all the time. So definitely uh, if you want to see a lot more manatees, my guess is if you come back this weekend, uh, to the yes. camera, uh, and also to Manatee Lagoon, right? Uh, then mm -hmm. we should see a lot more. Yes. Yeah, so this manatee right now, he's going all up against the seawall because that's where the water is the warmest. So a lot of times our manatees like to go in this corner here. They will sometimes pile up on top of each other because they like to be where it's the very warmest. And they'll do something very silly. So when you go outside and it's really cold, sometimes your nose gets colder first. The manatees are the same way. So what they do when it's cold is they stick their nose in the sand and it looks like they're blowing bubbles. It is very cute, but the sand is very warm. So they like to keep their nose nice and warm. Um, but our manatee, he is as, as far back as he can be in the back corner. He did stick his nose up to breathe once and he looks like he might again. But like I said, he is absolutely in the corner right next oh, to that. he just stuck his nose oh. up might be hard to see oh that might be the, it means they're there's a little circle yeah so the yeah. water visibility isn't the best today because it's been so windy and this water is is at high tide it comes in from the ocean and it's usually a little more clear versus low tide it all goes out that inlet and it's a little bit more murky but right now since it's been so windy it's a, a little bit hard to see through the water and if we have any questions from our classes about marine biology or manatees or any other animals in the ocean that we want to get out there, um, now is the time to ask and we can answer them while trying to get a look at that manatee. I believe we've got about five or six minutes left, so fire away with any questions you've got for us. Yep, no questions just yet. Um, but as we were saying, the temperature is going down to 38 on Saturday. Um, you know, highs of 50s and 60s all the way through Tuesday. So if you're in the area, it's probably a great time to swing by Manatee Lagoon. And then um, if not, you can always join their cameras on their website that we put in the chat. Um, what time are you guys open? And can you share any information about the holidays as well? Like what days you might be closed? Yes. So um, during Manatee season, um, Typically, we're open Monday through Sunday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. 
Uh, but for the upcoming holidays, we are open from nine to two on Christmas Eve. We're closed on Christmas Day and we're open fully from nine to four the day after Christmas. We are open from nine to two on New Year's Eve and we are closed on New Year's Day. But otherwise we are open every single day uh, from nine to four. And you can definitely come, ask us all kinds of questions and see our fish tanks as well as hopefully see some manatees. I, I do think this weekend will be good, but also the good thing about a cold front is that sometimes the manatees don't come until the second or third day. So I don't think they'll all be here and gone on Christmas. I think they'll probably be here um, throughout the beginning of next week because it takes a little while for the ocean to cool down uh, compared to the air. Well, that is definitely good information to have. We are going to just turn this camera. I think I'm going to keep it this way just in case the manatee pops up. Yeah, but we want to say thank you so much to Manatee Lagoon. And on behalf of the Educational Technology Department, thank you. And John, I know you have some finishing slides and I'm just going to keep facing this way. For sure. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. We're so glad that you are here. We'll keep their little camera up there in the bottom corner. Um, but we this concludes our 2022 virtual learning experiences for winter. Um, but again, you can come back to our channel by clicking down below or visiting our website and revisit the Great Smoky Mountains from yesterday or um, Loggerhead Marine Life Center from this morning or again, rewatch our Manatee Lagoon video. All of those learning experiences are on our website as well. We have one big giant playlist of all the virtual learning experiences we've ever done that's on the website as well. So you just click virtual learning experiences on the left side and that playlist will be there for you to see all the different places we've visited from the Norton Museum to Shenandoah um, to many other places as well. So, um, we hope you're enjoying these this series. Um, for teachers in Palm Beach, we have some great training on the first day back from our break, January 3rd. We're doing an awesome Adobe Creative Institute with Tanya Avrith from Adobe. And uh, that's gonna be in person at Palm Beach Gardens. And then we also have a full subscription to Pear Deck, um, a premium subscription. So we're gonna be doing Pear Deck 101 and 201. For those of you who are interested in using that and one-upping your um, your classroom teaching. And then for those of you who are elementary, whoops, go back one more. For those of you who are elementary, um, our colleague John Long's last hurrah will be on January 4th when he finishes up the finds model for elementary, which is basically a research model. He's already done a whole series for secondary, which is on our website, and this will actually conclude the uh, elementary portion of all of this, and uh, that will be John's last hurrah, as he will be retiring two days later. So be sure to join him at 2.45 on January 4th. And so with that, on behalf of the entire EdTech team as a whole, we want to thank you so much for joining us today and every day that we live stream. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this trip to Manatee Lagoon and your students enjoyed it as well. And from Dana and myself and the rest of the team, we hope you have a happy and healthy holiday break. And we can't wait to see you when we get back next year. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.